Bible, I wish you would turn to the book of First Chronicles chapter number 12, First Chronicles chapter 12, and we are going to be Bible heavy tonight, so keep your Bibles close. I hope, I hope you brought your Bible. If you didn't, maybe you can look around, someone near you has a Bible, and I think it'd be great if you just looked on with them. First Chronicles chapter number 12. And verse number 32, and, and by the way, I, I know I mentioned I'm glad that Nexus is in here. Uh, I really am. I want you guys to know how glad I am that you are in this service tonight. Um, I want to say this, and I want to say this at risk of sounding uh, predictable, but these students are facing a culture and pressure that I did not face. There is an onslaught of thinking and ideology loose in the world today that is so far beyond. Now, I know we've had pressures in every generation. That's without question. But there, is, there are ideologies and there are accepted mindsets in culture today that are so far beyond and so far removed from the norms of yesterday that uh, for this group, to live for God, to be strong in the Lord, to be soul winners, to be worshipers, I want you to know how much I believe in you and how much I appreciate you walking with God in this time that we live in right now. You are to be commended for that. You are to be commended for that. And, uh, and I appreciate I'm glad you're here because you're going to help us learn tonight. We're all going to learn together. First Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 32, it makes reference to a group called the sons of Issachar who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Their chiefs were 200 and all their brethren were at that command. What a compliment was given to this tribe of Israel that they were individuals who had understanding of their times. They knew the time in which they lived. Now, we have a great need tonight to understand the times in which we live. But please hear me, and I'm not going to waste any words tonight. Not to approve of the times in which we live, but to understand rather how to feel, how to act, and how to negotiate our way through this life. That's the kind of understanding that we need. Today is not the day for the church to posture itself with its hands in the air saying, I give up, the tidal wave of immorality is too big, we're going to throw in the towel and let the world win. Now's not the time for that. Now is not the time for the church to posture itself as an ostrich perhaps who sticks its head in the sand and is oblivious and never talks about current events, never approaches the culture of our day. And I know there is hesitation and some people there is fear to talk about current events because of how fast culture changes. But now is not the time to ignore what is going on in the world. And I will say this, and I don't hope I don't have to prove this, but I'll say it just in case there's someone riding the fence. Now is not the time to get swept up and embrace the culture of our world. Can I just say it plain tonight? Now is not the time to be worldly. To embrace worldly mindsets and ideas that come not from the Lord, not from the Holy Spirit, not from the Word of God, but from a, an age or a culture in which we live. And so it is a very unique time that we find ourselves in. Now, I could, if I wanted to tonight, dissect each and every event of the last 25, 30, 40, 50 years. We will do some of that. We'll talk about some of the specific events that have happened in the recent past. However, it is important when we discuss how we interact with culture and how a Christian should behave and act and negotiate our way through the world today that we get a proper paradigm. Everyone say paradigm. I'm going to have them put this word on the screen, and it looks like the word paradigm, but it is not. It is the word paradigm. The word paradigm simply means a way of viewing or a lens 
that we look through. And every one of us has a paradigm that we use to view the world. Um, some people, let me just use politicians as an example. I'm not here to bash on politicians. A lot of politicians use polls as their paradigm. They let polls determine how they see they're doing in a race. That's their lens that they look through. Or they use money. Who can give them the greatest return financially for their campaign? And that becomes their view. That is their lens. We all, every one of us has a lens that we look through, a paradigm. Some have pop culture as their lens. Some have a friend's opinion as their lens. Uh, some people have a church as their lens that they look through. Now, let me stop here and make a statement that on the surface may sound a little bit strange, but I don't believe that our living for God should be determined by simply what the church says. We have to get living for God in our spirit for ourselves. We have to have a unique and personal relationship with the word of God. This thing has got to get personal because the harder the winds of immorality blow, the more our commitment will be tested. And that's not the time that I need to say, well, I'm going to stay away from that or I'm going to do that because my church says that. Please don't cop out and use that excuse. Let's get a relationship with God. Let's dig into his word. Let's find out what the word of God says. Now. I will say that, and I want you to know, I believe, and I humbly say this, that you can trust what's being communicated here at this church. Because we, like all of us should, are trying to teach what we're going to teach and believe what we're going to believe out of the Word of God. I'll have a whole lot more to say about that. But we must have a, a lens, a way of viewing that is based on a personal relationship with God. Everybody say paradigm. paradigm. Now, we have to understand as Christians, first and foremost, that we, according to the Bible, are pilgrims and strangers in this world. Let's get some Bible precedent for this. Hebrews chapter 11. Would you turn there in your Bible, please? Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 13. This is a great passage. This is the hall of faith. A lot of people call this the hall of faith. Passage. Many different people and their examples of faith are referenced here. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 13. After referencing Abraham and Jacob and, and Noah and all these great heroes of the faith. Sarah 13 says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they, that's them, they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. One version of the Bible says the people that declare these things plainly uh, admit that they seek a different city. These people of faith, and may I say it larger than just Hebrews 11, we as people of faith understand we are just pilgrims in this earth. We are just strangers in this earth. The worse that it gets in our culture, it ought to make us feel homesick. It ought to put a rub in our spirit, if I can use that cliche. We, we're just passing through here. We are not born. We were born once of this earth, but we were reborn through the power of the Holy Ghost. And because of that, it ought to bother us what's happening in the world. We ought not to be able to turn a, a deaf ear or a blind eye to what's going on. It ought, to, it ought to bother us. We're passing through. We're strangers. We're pilgrims. Secondly, Christians unashamedly look to the Bible as our moral compass and our guide through life. Unashamedly. Now, if you're going to go to sleep tonight while I teach, don't fall asleep yet. Because I'm fixing to give you the thesis statement behind everything that I'm teaching tonight. And that is this. If you and I will embrace this book as our paradigm. If you and I will look through the lens of the Bible, the lens of Scripture for how we judge things, how we interpret things, how we look at culture, how we look at life, the guidebook for our life. If we allow God's compass to be our lens... 
We're going to be okay. We're going to be all right. We have to depend upon the word of God. This is why I get so excited about Bible quiz ministry here at New Life. Because it is intentionally putting the word of God in children and teenagers. It is depositing in them, hopefully, a worldview that is dictated not by culture, but by God's eternal word. So if this is going to be our lens that we interpret culture through, let's make sure of, of this book. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Keep your Bible close. Here we go. You ready? Nudge your neighbor and say, get ready. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. If this is going to be our lens, let's make sure it's a, it's, a, it's a good lens. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Paul says this book, this Bible that hopefully is our lens for how to view culture today. It's profitable for us. It teaches us how to live right. It reproves us when we get too worldly. It comes alongside us and equips us for every good work. First Peter, would you go to First Peter? It's just a few pages over from there. First Peter chapter number 1. First Peter chapter number 1 and verse number 22. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Hey, somebody, listen tonight. The word that is our lens, it's an incorruptible word. It's not tainted. 24, because all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man is the flower of the grass. The grass withers and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Psalm 12 and 6, you can just make reference to this in your notes. Psalm 12 and 6 says, the word of God is pure. Proverbs 30, look at this Old Testament verse quickly if you would. Proverbs 30 and verse number 5, right at the tail end of the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 30 and verse number 5. Every word of God, let's get an amen to this, is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in Him. Agar said it, this word is pure. Pure. We can trust the Bible to be the lens, the viewing point that we look at life through. Hear me tonight. It's so good I put it, and it's so important I put it in all caps. We must be convinced and settled that the Word of God is true and it is worth following. I want to say that one more time. We must, as Christians, become convinced and settled that the word of God is true and it is worth following. Now, church family, and I know it's mostly just church family tonight. If you and I can get the last five minutes down in our spirit, it's going to help us negotiate culture. It's going to help us. Because we're not going to throw our hands up in defeat. We're going to be able to judge things through the word of God. Is this making sense so far? Okay, let's talk about specifics. Just about, well, a little over a month ago, June the 26th, 2015, a decision was rendered by the United States Supreme Court. They began hearing arguments in April, and a lot of people overlooked the fact that this was an actual case. This was not just the Supreme Court deciding one morning we're going to talk about the validity of same-sex marriage in the United States. They're going to show you on the screen the actual case name that was uh, deliberated by the United States Supreme Court. Obergefell versus Hodges. This is a case that the United States Supreme Court began hearing arguments on in the month of April of this year. Uh, it was not until June the 26th, 2015, just a few weeks ago, that the decision came down. Now, basically, in a nutshell, Obergefell versus Hodges, when there was a decision rendered, it was a five to four decision by the United States Supreme Court. 
uh, it validated the recognition nationwide of same-sex marriage in the United States. Now, we got to understand a little bit of the background behind this decision, and maybe this will give us a little bit of a context. Uh, there are, as you know, uh, amendments to the United States Constitution. Way back in 1896, the 14th Amendment was added to the United States Constitution. And specifically within that 14th Amendment, well over 100 years ago, uh, was what is called the Equal Protection Clause. And I want to say, I want to go on record as saying, I am thankful that that clause and that amendment is, is attached to the United States Constitution. Because, uh, unfortunately, one of the stains on the history of the United States is uh, segregation and racism that was rampant, especially back when you go back. And I know some of you even have history of living in Little Rock during the Central High School uh, time in the 1950s and all of that. Uh, but I am thankful that in our country, people are treated equally. It would be horrible to live in a country that had a class society. And by the way, this is normal in third world countries for there to be the hierarchy of the country and then people who are considered lower class. And by the way, uh, I thank God for the fact that in the United States, women are elevated to the place of the value that they have. They're not just property. I thought I'd get a few female amens on that right there. You talk about female rights, Jesus was a champion of female rights. Amen. I won't get into that, that's not the point here. Up to June the 26th of 2015, the issue of the validity or the recognition nationally, well not just nationally, but the recognition of same-sex marriage was a state's issue. And I won't go into, and some of you know this better than I do, how our government structure is set up. Uh, it is, for the most part, intended to be power to the states, not top-heavy. And there's a big argument back and forth between politicians on big government versus small government and all of that. But it was intended with the founders of our country uh, that power would be given to the states. And so uh, the decision-making on this issue particularly up until June the 26th was a state's issue. Now, on June the 25th, the day before the, the Supreme Court uh, made their ruling on Obergefell versus Hodges, 37 of the states of the United States had recognized same-sex marriage. They were issuing same-sex marriage license, and they were recognizing that in their state. There were still 13 uh, of the 50 states that banned same-sex marriage uh, in our country. Basically, what happened on that morning of June 26 is the Supreme Court federalized what to that point was a state's issue. And basically, the Supreme Court said, uh, whatever has been decided by the states is in the past now. We are making it a federal mandate, a federal law, that every state must recognize same-sex marriage and uh, even recognize it across state lines. So... I want to show you on the screen as I begin to study through this what really came about with that decision. Can we go to the next slide here? Uh, this decision requires a state, requires the state of Arkansas, number one, and every other state, to issue a marriage license to two people of the same sex. It also requires a state to recognize a marriage between two people of the same sex. Now, when we understand the case itself, Obergefell versus Hodges, Mr. Obergefell had a same sex uh, partner that he was married to in a uh, state where same-sex marriage was legal. Uh, his um, partner, his husband, died, and then he went back home after he was in the hospital. Mr. Obergefell went back home and wanted to apply in his home state, which did not recognize same-sex marriage, for spousal benefits upon death, uh, care of children, that kind of thing. And so he sued to get this right, in, even in his state that didn't recognize same-sex marriage. And his state of Ohio at that time uh, did not look at Maryland, where he had been married to this other man, and respect that decision across state lines. Are you with me so far? So this is why he took, took them to court, 
uh, and it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and that was the case that uh, really was the, the final thing that brought about this federalization of the same-sex marriage issue. Now, there are broader implications than just what you see on the screen right there. And it is the broader implications that I want to just mention briefly because this speaks to the culture of our country. The broader implications of what happened on June the 26th, 2015, because that did not happen in a vacuum in this country. But it is the acceptance of same-sex marriage as an institution and as a viable part of marriage. That is the broader implication. Please do not think, and I prayed, I prayed about what every word that I was going to say tonight. Please do not think that the people standing outside the Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. were all waving flags and celebrating because they were happy for Mr. Obergefell. It was much broader than that. It was the broad acceptance of same-sex marriage. Now, let me go back to the Supreme Court decision because it was 5-4, five, five justices in favor, four justices against. When they made this decision, in my estimation, in my feeling, as I prayed about this and, and prayed and asked the Lord for direction on how to present these things tonight to our church, there are three main issues that I think that this brings up that I want to touch on tonight before we go home. Number one, and we'll put these on the screen. Number one, it is the issue of the federal versus state authority. And I'm not going to go deep into that tonight because that is a governmental type discussion uh, but I think that that certainly is a discussion that, that many people have. What is the far reaching impact of the federal government, what they espouse and the power of the state so I think that is definitely one of the main issues number two is the broad cultural acceptance of same sex marriage now before I go into that uh, in just a few moments allow me to say this we would be kidding ourselves if we did not see a trend in the United States, regardless of whether the Supreme Court had rendered what they did on June 26. We, we're, we've been seeing a trend for a number of years now to where it's more culturally acceptable for same-sex marriage to be okay in the United States. We would be kidding ourselves if we were to say that, oh, no, it's not happening. It was happening right before our eyes. It still is happening in our country right before our eyes. So the, one of the main issues of this whole issue is the broad acceptance of same-sex marriage. And then thirdly, and we'll touch on this, is the church's response to the people involved and also, and this can't be missed, the laws and how that affects churches in particular. So let's talk just briefly about the federal versus the state authority. Let me read you a quote from a Supreme Court decision a couple of years ago in the state of Michigan where voters were wanting to amend the state's constitution to prohibit the use of affirmative action by public universities. And here's what the Supreme Court of the United States said at that time. And I quote, the constitution foresees the ballot box, not the courts, as the normal instrument for resolving differences and debates. I'm gonna read that one more time. The Supreme Court, the same one that ruled on June 26, what they ruled, said just a couple of years ago when they were brought a case by people in Michigan, the Constitution of the United States foresees the ballot box, the states, not the courts, as the normal instrument for resolving differences and debates. Now, obviously, in the last two years, something's changed. One of the premier dissenting voices on Obergefell versus Hodges was Chief Justice Roberts, John Roberts. And I want to read you some of the things that he said. He said, I'm writing because I have no choice but to dissent this ruling. Roberts made it clear that his, that his decision to dissent was based in the restrained conception of the judicial role in the United States rather than a personal view on the definition of marriage. He said, understand well what this dissent is about. It is not about whether in my judgment, Chief Justice Roberts' judgment, the institution of marriage should be changed to include same-sex couples. It is instead about whether in our democratic republic, that decision should rest with the people acting through their elected representatives 
or with five lawyers who happen to hold commissions authorizing them to resolve legal disputes according to the law. The Constitution leaves no doubt about the answer. Now, I want to show you another statement that he made, and this is pretty powerful what he said. The majority's decision, do we have this one? The majority's decision is an act of will, not legal judgment. The right it announces has no basis in the Constitution or this, this court's precedent. Just who do we think we are? Those are pretty powerful words by the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. He goes on to say, not only is the Constitution clear on this matter, but also this court's precedents have repeatedly described marriage in ways that are consistent only with its traditional meaning. He finishes by saying, those who founded our country would not recognize the majority's conception of the judicial role. They never have imagined yielding that right on a question of social policy to unaccountable and unelected judges. Now, the reason why I take a little bit of time to kind of go through the minutia of what Justice Roberts said and this whole federal versus the state authority thing is because there is a strong feeling in our country that because the Supreme Court says something, that becomes the way people feel about something. And for us to embrace that is to miss personal responsibility. Because we cannot legislate acceptance. We cannot decide through a court or a legislative body what people accept. Personally, we have to come to grips with this. And we've got to use that lens, use that paradigm that is most important, and that is the word of the Lord. The second main issue that I mentioned was the broad cultural acceptance of same-sex marriage. Without question, it's been happening in our country for quite a while. Let's look at what the Bible, if this is going to be our guide, let's look at what the Bible says. Romans chapter number 1. Go with me now. Romans chapter number 1 and verse number 26. Let's start at 24. God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. For even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the personality, or I'm sorry, the penalty of their error, which was due. Would you skip a little farther back in the Bible to the book of Jude? It only has one chapter. And in Jude, the, the fifth verse. But I want to remind you that once you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. 1 Corinthians chapter number 7 and verse number 2. Nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, let each man have his own wife, and let each woman have her own wife. Husband. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Now I want you to notice that Pastor tonight has taken us through four or five different passages that speak of the connotation connected in Scripture with homosexuality. And I also want you to notice that I have not gone to the Old Testament yet. Because there are a lot of people that would say when a preacher goes to the Old Testament, the book of Leviticus, I'll reference these in just a moment, will say things like, that's under the law. That's Old Testament. What we have to understand about any sin is that 
its sin and the penalty for that sin will carry through the entirety of Scripture. We cannot pick one verse out and determine a whole doctrine on that. But when you and I look, please listen, and and please don't zone out right now. If this is challenging you, if you're looking up here and saying, I don't know if I agree with this, please listen to this whole message tonight. If you and I honestly look at the scripture, and I'm going to mention homosexuality right now, and I'm going to get off that subject in just a minute and mention something else. But if we honestly look at that, that, that practice in the scripture, there is no other way that can, it can be understood than that is not the plan of God. If we look in the Old Testament where the Lord says it's detestable for a man to lie with a man. If we look at Sodom and Gomorrah where they were given over to homosexuality and judgment reigned upon that. If we go into the New Testament which gives us the ultimate plan for marriage. There is no other way. Now, I know there are people that can argue that, but that is trying to grasp something out of the word that quite simply is not there. There is an inbred truth of prohibition against homosexuality in the Bible. That's inherent in the word of God. Now, lest someone thinks the pastor was just waiting to get up here to bash on homosexuality. Do you know that is just one sin that is mentioned in 1 Corinthians? You know revilers aren't going to get in the kingdom either? extortioners aren't going to get in the kingdom either liars aren't going to get in the kingdom either hello so whereas it might be a hobby horse of someone kind of just get it all up in their spirit and start making crude comments about people that are engaged in a homosexual lifestyle we better make sure we're living by this word brothers and sisters talk about the church's response first of all to people I listened to a fascinating interview that brother David Bernard did a few months ago brother Bernard those of you don't know who he is he's a the general superintendent of the United Pentecostal Church he was asked the question how do we as the church today deal with um, all of these issues with regards to lesbian gay bisexual transgender in our culture today and he made some wonderful comments and I just want to share a few of those few of my comments as well tonight first of all when we consider how we as a church respond to people involved in a homosexual lifestyle we must treat everyone with love and respect everyone we don't need to feel threatened by people who are involved in a homosexual lifestyle. We treat people the same way we would want to be treated, with love and respect. Over the years, in my adult life, I have had friends who are involved in a homosexual lifestyle. I've sat down and shared meals with them. I've had times when, uh, had good conversations about things that had nothing to do about morality. And they were very logical and they were kind. And see, folks, we have to remember that we are Christians all the time. We don't shun people. We treat them as we would anyone else. You see, homosexuality is like other types of deviant lifestyles mentioned in the scripture. It is a sin according to God's word. So we do not approve of that lifestyle because God's word speaks against that lifestyle again that's our lens that's our paradigm but I think it is important that we come at this issue and we come at our response to individuals involved in same-sex marriage or uh, homosexual lifestyle uh, with a Christian attitude and, and, and listen very closely it's important the context that we place this issue in not singling it out but believing with everything inside of us that is with any other type of sin, we believe in transformation. We believe in hope. We believe that God can change people's lives. And I am so thankful to tell you we have had people over the years come to this church 
who have been involved in homosexual lifestyles who have said, you know what, I don't want to be involved in that anymore. What is that? That is a God recognition of turning away from a sinful act, and the Lord opens his arms and says, yes, I will receive you, and guess what, the church will too. The church will too. So if you're here tonight and you've ever wondered, I wonder what would happen if we had a same-sex couple come to New Life Church. What would pastor's belief and stance be on that? I want everyone to know people are welcome at this church. Do we have responsibilities and qualifications and things that people walk in in order to be used in different capacities? Yes, and that will not change regardless of who it is. But we're going to love people. Amen. Amen. God has a better plan. God doesn't stand here tonight to people that are involved in same-sex marriage, homosexual lifestyle, with a message of condemnation. He does come with a truth about the prohibition of that in Scripture. And as long as I have breath, as God leads me, I will, I will not shun to speak that. I'm going to do it in a Christian way. I'm going to do it in a kind way. I'm not going to use this as a bully pulpit. I will teach on that just like I teach on any other sin in the Bible. But we do believe in transformation, folks. And so rather than couching it in some threatening term, we're going to come at this and say that God's got a better plan for us. God's got a better plan. I also think it's important, and, and, and this is really big, that we avoid a spirit of suspicion. See, the worldly concept is that homosexuality is your identity. That's a worldly concept. That is not a biblical concept. Homosexuality involves homosexual acts. And so people who come, and I've had people over the years come to me and say, I'm involved in a homosexual lifestyle and I want to get out of that lifestyle. My first bit of advice to them is stop the homosexual act. That's the starting point. Because when I cease that sinful behavior, I then can walk in a new way. And I don't have to be identified with sinful acts. See, the world says, well, you, you were born that way. This is just who you are. You might as well embrace that. But, but see, if we look at the scripture as our guide, Genesis 1 says... Uh, God said, I'm going to create man in my image. That's our intended identity. Not the identity of a practice, but in the identity of the Lord himself. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. And, and I'll also say this, and, and I think that it's important that we, we not miss this part. Uh, the big issue right now in the United States, obviously with this rendering, is the same-sex marriage issue. But... Really, the struggle is to be sexually pure, period. Across the board. And so what God says to someone involved in a same-sex marriage or a homosexual lifestyle is the same thing he would say to someone living in adultery or fornication. Stop. It's a battle. It's a struggle across the board for morality, for sexual purity. And uh, it's so beautiful when we see the grace of God beginning to take a foothold in people's lives. And they begin to recognize, can I say it like this? We, because we all have to come to this place where we recognize the error of our ways. We say, Lord, I'm, I'm not strong enough. I've got to have you. I've got to have you help me. Amen. Now, uh, I will finish tonight. I want to just quickly, in just in two minutes, tell you, the church, how we respond to people, yes, we've talked about that, but how we respond to the law itself, and I'll briefly touch that in just two minutes. But I also want to say that um, it is very important, especially in, in the hour in which we live, we war in the spirit. Because the battles that we are facing right now are not flesh and blood. They are spiritual in nature. The Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, rulers of the darkness of this world spiritual wickedness in high places we are in a spiritual warfare please do not believe 
that any of the issues going on right now do not have spiritual agendas attached to them. They do. And so we have to wrestle in the spirit and war in the spirit. We've got to pray like we've never prayed. If you know someone, and the reason why this is an applicable topic, because all of us know somebody. All of us right now know somebody, whether they are involved in a homosexual lifestyle or some sort of deviant, sinful lifestyle. Every family in here knows somebody connected somehow to, to what we have to do. We have to war for their souls. We've got to pray in the spirit. If there's ever a time to intercede for the souls of lost people, it's right now. Amen? We're in a spiritual battle, folks. We're in a spiritual battle. And, and, and let me just finish tonight. Uh, we are looking closely at how obviously the, the, the rendering of the Supreme Court's decision affects churches, because that's one of the things that quickly people begin to ask, you know, is it going to get to the place where churches have to marry people that are same-sex marriage couples? Uh, we're going to, as a church, in, in the right spirit, but in a very decided way, adopt a very clear statement of faith regarding human sexuality and marriage. That's going to be a part of who we are in our bylaws of our church. Um, uh, we're going to set up other uh, types of uh, policies whereby weddings are part of the worship of this church. So that, Lord willing, and I don't know how the government's going to keep on changing and evolving, we're going to set up at least structure to uh, safeguard ourselves from ever feeling forced to step against. Because we're not going to do that. Uh, and, and I'm not saying this is a threat, but we'll lose our our tax status before we're going to transgress the word of God, folks. I don't want that to happen. But we're not going to go that way. We're not going to transgress God's word because that's our lens. That's our, that's our, our paradigm. Uh, but we're going to do our very best to structure policy here. Uh, and there are some, admittedly, in the world that would look at that as somehow the church fearful or somehow the church alienated and alienating people. All I can tell you is what I've preached for the last 40 minutes. This church is a lighthouse for people. This church is a lighthouse for people. Whosoever will, I'll just use the words of the Lord, whosoever will, let him come. Amen. Walk in the word of God. Walk in obedience to God's word. Is this making sense tonight? I mean, I think it's very, very important how we negotiate this this season uh, of the culture. I want us to stand together. We're going to be dismissed in just a minute. But as I was um, praying even this morning about this message tonight, the Lord prompted me to Revelation chapter number 2. And he directed me to one of the churches of Asia Minor. And the Lord corrected a error that I always thought about something. Don't you love it when God corrects you? Quickly, let me tell you the way I've wrongly looked at these churches in times past. I have wrongly looked at the churches in Asia Minor. There's seven of them mentioned. And I've always thought, and this is just me being real transparent, you know, the church at Philadelphia, if you read that one in Revelation 3, they really were the only church that went without some sort of reprimand or correction by Jesus. The other ones had good things said about them, but then Jesus would say, but I got this against you. You left your first love, church at Ephesus. Um, you embraced the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, one church did. You've put up with the, with Jezebel's spirit in your church, one church did. And I used to think that those failing things disqualified every good thing that that church did. And the Lord spoke to me this morning, and here's what he said. Now, stay with me. The Lord said, uh, hey, uh, Tim, you know that church you pastor in Cabot? Yeah. Y'all do everything right? Don't you hate when God sets you up? <laughs> Anything about the church that you lead that you, you, you wish was different? 
I can tell you where I was. I was sitting at my kitchen table. And I was having a conversation with the Lord in my mind going, really, you got to go there? <laughs> of course there's things we don't do right. Of course there's things that we should do different. And here's what Jesus said to me this morning. He said, do you think that just because of that, that cancels out every good thing that that church does? I give you grace to work through that. And I give you strength to do right. He pointed me to Revelation chapter 2 to the church at Pergamos. And I want you to look at this. Oh, is this powerful. Revelation 2 and 13. Uh, let's do 12. To the angel of the church in Pergamos, write, These things saith he who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works, where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Now he goes on in 14 and says, I got a few things against you. You've let a doctrine of Balaam come in the church. But he said, I want you to know something. I uniquely positioned you at the very seat of Satan. And in the context of where you were positioned, you did not deny my name. You did not abandon the faith. And so I want to speak to New Life Church tonight and tell you emphatically what the Holy Ghost spoke to me today. The more we go in this culture, the more it's going to seem like the church is positioned at the very seat of Satan himself. If you've ever read the newspaper and thought, can anything worse happen? Well, guess where the Lord decided to put his church? In the very middle of a culture that is sliding farther and farther away. But we have a decision to make tonight. We're not going to deny his name. And we're not going to abandon the faith. Stay strong, New Life. Hold fast, New Life Church. Don't throw up your hands and say it's not worth being holy. Stay strong in the faith. When it seems like you are seated at the very seat of Satan, that's where the church is needed the most. And I will close with this. I give you my word, it's 8.07. We're going to go eat snow cones. But listen to me. You are looking at a pastor that no matter how bad it gets in the world, I am more convinced than ever before today is the greatest opportunity that God's church has ever had. Because the darker it gets, the brighter the church can shine. So let's not lose hope. Let's not lose hope. If you've got your Bible, I want you to grab your Bible and hold on to it. God, we are standing on this word. God, when it comes to the issue of same-sex marriage, when it comes to the issue of homosexuality, when it comes to the issue of immorality of any sort, or when it comes to the issue of how we live our life today, how we negotiate our way through this culture as a church, we are standing on your word tonight. I pray that you would impress us as believers to trust your word, to look at culture through the lens of your word. I pray a special anointing on our youth group right now. I pray that in a generation that is so upside down from even the way their parents were brought up, I pray you would give this youth group like never before such a strong belief in the word of God. Let their life be positioned and wrap themselves around this word. I thank you for that. I give you glory for that. And I give you praise in the name of Jesus Christ. God, I pray as we close that, that you would give us a revival of every type of sinner in this city. Give us a revival. God, we're not going to pigeonhole the revival and say it has to come from one culture, one ethnicity, one type of people. Lord, we just want people who are hungry for God, wanting a change in their life. Give us favor. Give us the spirit of Christ. Give us kindness and boldness at the same time. For that, I will thank you and give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen.